our modern day-to-day -day lives are made of countless interactions with the objects we encounter. From the tiniest particles to the biggest structures. Join us as we explore the inside workings of the world around us. This is Inside Things. Life Vest or Flotation Devices Ever wonder how a life jacket can save you? Well first, let's find out how objects are able to stay afloat in water. Archimedes' principle tells us that when an object is submerged in water, it displaces an amount of water according to its mass. So as a result, water pushes upward against the object in a force that's equal to the amount of water it has displaced. Now, the amount of water displaced by an object is determined by its density. Density is the measure of how much mass is contained in an object. Related to its volume or the amount of space an object occupies. Let's take two balls for example. A marble and a ping pong ball. Both may have the same volume, but the marble definitely is heavier. Therefore, also much denser. So when the marble is submerged in water, the water is supposed to push it upward with the same force equal to the water it has displaced. But because the marble is heavier than the water it has displaced, it sinks. The ping pong ball, however, is filled with air, weighing much lighter than the water it has displaced. That's why it stays afloat. The force that keeps it floating is called buoyant force. You'll feel that buoyant force when you try pushing the ping pong ball down further into the water. It'll be hard to sink the ping pong ball into the water because of the upward push from the water. This buoyant force is also responsible for the lightweight feeling we get when we're swimming in a pool. Our bodies are mostly made up of water. Our body's density is also close to that of water. An average person needs just about 7 to 12 pounds of added buoyancy to float. And this is where the life jacket comes in. It provides that extra lift. Your body already initially has buoyancy. So all a life jacket needs to do is keep your head above water. Meaning it has to displace only that little amount of water. The life jacket doesn't need to keep your entire weight afloat. Now what's inside a life jacket that helps add buoyancy? Most commonly used materials are plastic foams, which use closed cells that trap air in pockets once the jacket is submerged in water. Rubber There's just so much you can do with rubber thanks to its elastic properties. But what makes it so? Rubber is a type of polymer called elastomer, which is a large molecule that can be stretched to at least twice its original length and still return back to its original shape. Entropy is what makes a rubber stretchy. In physics, this is what we call the second law of thermodynamics. It dictates that a system will move from a state of order to disorder. Let's try picturing this in real-life situations. Toys are easy to destroy and disassemble, but putting them back together can be quite a puzzle. It's easy to draw a doodle on a blank piece of paper, but it's hard to return it back to a clean slate. And while entropy seems to be an inconvenience, it's what makes rubber work. We've mentioned that rubber is a polymer, which are shaped like very long chains. 
when rubber is in its normal state, meaning it is not being stretched. It means that its molecules are tangled up in a random disorder. We can say that the rubber in this state has a high degree of entropy. But once the rubber is stretched, its molecules align in an orderly manner. The very long molecular chains are now lined up in one direction. Therefore, the rubber now has a low degree of entropy. And then when you let go of the rubber, it goes back to its original disordered state. Now there are many ways to treat rubber to make it more useful. Mastication is where rubber is chewed up through a machine so as to make it softer, stickier, and moldable. Afterwards, chemical ingredients are often mixed into the rubber to make it more hard-wearing. Calendaring is when it's squashed into specific shapes by rollers. Extrusion is squeezing rubber through specially shaped holes to make hollow tubes. Lastly, vulcanization is a heat treatment that adds sulfur to rubber. This makes it harder and more durable. This process was discovered by American inventor Charles Goodyear when he accidentally dropped rubber on a hot stove. The rubber cooked itself and then altered its form. This became one of the most useful materials of all time. The Goodyear Tire Company was named in its honor. Batteries Batteries are a lifesaver especially in times when we can't generate electricity but need it in order to power a certain object or machine. A battery is a device that consists of cells capable of storing chemical energy that can be turned into electricity, becoming a source of power. But how do these work? First, let's get familiar with the definitions. Electricity is the flow of electrons via a conductive path, like a wire. This path is called a circuit. Batteries are made up of three parts. The anode, or the terminal that contains negatively charged electrodes. The cathode, or the terminal that has positively charged electrodes. And the electrolyte. It is the cathode and anode that are connected to an electric circuit for the battery to function. When a battery is connected to an electric circuit, a chemical reaction takes place. This causes a buildup of electrons at the anode and consequently, an electrical difference between the anode and cathode. We can also define it as an unstable buildup of electrons. But the electrons would want to become stable again by rearranging themselves. The electrons' behavior is always to repel each other, so they naturally move away from each other. Now, inside a battery, the only way for them to go is the cathode. However, the electrons cannot take the direct path from the anode to the cathode within the battery due to the electrolyte. An electrolyte is a liquid or solid substance that keeps the anode and cathode separate from each other. Ordinary batteries usually have dry powder as electrolytes. But once a wire becomes present to connect the anode to the cathode, the electrons now have another way to get to the cathode. This system is called a closed circuit. Imagine if we put light bulbs within the path of the wire. As the electrons go through it, the bulbs will each light up. Because as electrons pass the wire, electrical current flows. This is how a battery provides power. Electrodes in batteries always come from two dissimilar materials. Otherwise, there would be no flow of current. One of the materials should be the one giving up electrons, while the other one should be on the receiving end. This is necessary for electric current to flow.
Record Needle Can you imagine how powerful a needle is? In 1877, Thomas Edison made a breakthrough discovery. He wondered what would happen if he attached a needle to the diaphragm of a telephone receiver. He thought that the needle would etch an impression of sound onto a quickly moving paper and create a recording for sound writing. From this, Edison was able to develop a way to record sound. Remember that sounds are vibrations that travel through air or another media. And Edison wanted to record these sound waves so they can be played back. These recordings are converted back into sound by another needle. Edison then designed a phonograph, a device made of brass cylinder wrapped in tin foil. It is operated by turning its hand crack for the brass cylinder to rotate and move lengthwise. On one side of the phonograph is the diaphragm that's connected to a needle. The diaphragm is made up of a very thin membrane. So here's how sound is recorded. The sound waves cause the diaphragm to vibrate and the needle to etch a groove into the tinfoil that surrounds the brass cylinder, which at the same time is being turned by the hand crank. While on the other side of the diaphragm is a second needle and an amplifier. So when the brass cylinder is set back to its starting position and the needle is placed on its grooves, the original sound is now reproduced and the vibrations are amplified. Edison's first ever voice recording into his invention was himself shouting the words too, Mary had a little lamb. He used a mouthpiece, which caused the sound waves to vibrate the needle and etch his singing into the tin foil, so he could listen to it again. So the phonograph could not only record sound, it could play it back too. During that same year, German inventor Emil Berliner developed Edison's phonograph. He made the gramophone, a machine that turned a hard rubber disc on a flat plate or the turntable, replacing the brass cylinder. Its only function is to play back recordings, but this format was what started the recording industry. Bowling ball What makes up a bowling ball? Two major parts make up the bowling ball, its core and its cover stock. Each can be made from a variety of materials or combinations of these, which all can alter the ball's on-lane performance. Let's take a closer look. One of the bowling ball's main parts is the core. About 20-40% to 40 of the ball's behavior is due to its core its shape, components, and various mass properties. Common shapes include a light bulb, spherical, and elliptical. The coarse mixture is made up of a heavy substance, such as bismuth graphite or barium, plus either resin or a ceramic material. Resin produces a very dense type of plastic, while ceramic cores make harder hitting balls. This is because no energy is absorbed by the ceramic cores, thus creating more impact on the pins. Combination cores are made by a ball that's enclosed by a core of a specific shape and density, and within a second core of another shape and density. A weight block or small counterweights can also be added to the main core. In some balls, 2 to 4 ounces or 56 to 113 grams of iron oxide is used as a weight block to shift the ball's center of gravity towards one side of the core. Zirconium is also used for counterweights. Meanwhile, the cover stock is the outermost portion of the ball that gets in contact with the lane. About 60 to 80 percent of the ball's performance on the lane is due to its cover stock. 
its thickness can measure from 1 inch or 2.5 centimeters to 2 inch or 5.08 centimeters. There are a variety of materials used in making the cover stock, such as dense hardwoods like lignum vitae, hard rubber, polyester, or plastic. Most common today is reactive resin, which is made from polyurethane. Polyurethane component provides greater friction on the lane, especially on the wood lanes with polyurethane varnish and the fully synthetic lanes with polyurethane surfaces. The reactive resin cover stocks are also treated with additives while in its liquid state, creating pores that allow it to absorb oil. And when oil is absorbed into the ball, there is greater friction between the ball and the lane. This type developed into the particle balls, wherein small particles are distributed to the reactive polyurethane of the cover stock, so that it causes higher friction on the lanes. and turn these into electronic signals. The light detector is called a charge couple device or CCD. It is stored via a green rectangular chip with gold wires. Now, let's try to understand how a digital camera works by understanding pixel images. Take a look at the television screen closely. Notice how the pictures are made of very tiny colored dots or squares called pixels? Images on laptop LCD computer screens also use pixels. In these TV or computer screens, electronic equipment can switch these colored pixels on and off instantly. Light from the screen travels to your eyes, and your brain is fooled to seeing large moving pictures. Now the exact opposite happens in a digital camera. The light that comes from the object you're taking a photo of zooms into the camera lens. This incoming image hits the CCD, or the light detector. It breaks up the image into millions and billions of pixels. Then, the CCD measures the color and brightness of each pixel and stores it as a number. As a result, your digital image becomes a long series of numbers, each containing the exact details of what every pixel contains. And this is how the image is converted and stored digitally. A sneeze. A sneeze or sternutation is the convulsive expulsion of air from the lungs through the nose and mouth. This is usually caused by foreign particles that irritate the nostrils. Sneezing is a reflex. The body's automatic response to the irritation and its way to clear the nasal airways. Imagine a sneeze like a computer reboot. When the environment becomes too much for your nose, 
it needs a biological reboot via a sneeze. When a sneeze takes effect, it resets the nasal environment in order for the bad stuff inhaled through the nose to be released. Possible factors linked to sneezing include feathers, pollen, smoke, pepper, colds or flu, allergies, viral infections or when exposed to a change in temperature or cold air, or bright light. Yes, a sudden exposure to bright light may actually cause sneezing. This reaction is called a photic sneeze reflex. It has been said that the signals that tell the brain to shrink the pupils and the presence of bright light may cross paths with the signals the brain receives to sneeze. Now here's what happens during a sneeze. The lining of your nose gets irritated and naturally your body reacts. Your chest muscles compress your lungs, sending a wheeze of air upwards. The opening of your throat and mouth wants to block it. But the gush of air from the lungs, which travels 100 miles or 161 kilometers per hour, is too strong. So the air forces its way through the nose in a form of a sneeze. In fact, a sneeze can travel up to 30 to 35 miles or 48 to 56 kilometers per hour. The mucus, which may actually contain germs, can land as far as 30 feet or 9 meters away. Most of the time, a sneeze can be controlled. Closing your eyes involuntarily during a sneeze is also usually part of the process. It's very hard to sneeze otherwise. And no, the heart doesn't stop when you sneeze. Although the heart rate does slow down, and this is because of the deep breath you take before sneezing. But this shouldn't be a cause for worry. It's a natural reaction, and the effect is very minimal. There you have it! Another episode down the drain! Still, there are countless more things to explore! Join us next time as we look and know more about the world around us. See you next time on Inside Things.